welcome amazing investors, realtors. Um, who else do we have out there? Possibly uh, some financial advisors. Welcome everyone to the call. Today is March 28, 2019, and this is mastermind call number uh, 221. Hard to believe we've made it this far. We um, we sound a little bit different today, guys. We're in a quarterly partners planning session in Cocoa, Florida. So Tim is running the board today, and he's especially strict. If you definitely want to participate, get in now, because we usually close that queue at about 2.30. Um, we, got, and we, we, have three in the queue. we have three in the queue right now, bud. All right. Well, let's in, sign in early. Don't wait till the end to get shut out. So I guess we... Um, not, we're doing a lot of planning this week. I'm sure we'll have things to share with you next week, but let's uh, jump right to the queue. All righty. Our first one in the queue, the last four digits of that phone number are 1908. Go ahead. Yeah, I've got a question. I, I haven't got my uh, my uh, leads yet. I'm sure they're on the way, but the, my question is uh, when we – contact the probate attorney uh, what type of envelope do we use on that just a regular business envelope or we send the invitation type envelope uh, I'm sure they've gotten them from other people before I don't lawyer feeling like I'm trying to trick him into opening the envelope but uh, which one would be best so you're better off to do office visits when you're building your attorney network um, we find, I mean, mail can be effective, but we definitely find that a face-to-face -face is way more effective on those. And, uh, yes, it's more work than mail, but it's work you only do once, and it can feed you for the rest of your career. So if you're, if you're up to, if you have the time to get in the car and go visit those folks, that's going to be far more effective than a direct mail campaign for attorneys. Okay. Some and of the Chad, things, if, if you... Yeah, go ahead. Is that if you if you do mail, what we found to be effective is is a number ten business envelope with like regarding the estate of or regarding docket number, and we give you that information so we can we can merge that on the envelope. So you know, putting the docket number on there does make sure that it gets to the attorney. Um, we we have heard of attorneys that will actually bill the family for an hour because it had the docket number. I don't think that's common, but it has happened. But that, that's kind of proven that it does get through the gatekeeper, like that it, the, the attorney invoiced the estate meant putting the docket number on the envelope got it on his desk. Right, because have, they have to open that. Somebody's got to open that letter to see it. The other thing I'd say is that some of this is, is I won't say market specific, but it, it, it literally depends on what that attorney's practice is. If that attorney's practice is wrapped around uh, wrapped around what you're doing, anything that you can do. If they're, you know, if they're typically a family attorney and that's what they're doing, and they do a lot of these, uh, you know, they're in the practice of opening those letters, and that's the people you want to get to. So repetition works. And you know, Chad's point is that showing up is very definitive. If you can get through the front door and uh, get through the physical person that's sitting at that desk and get some time with them, you're in great shape. But there are certainly people who have been quite successful getting that first appointment by doing rounds of mailings, and we know that that works as well. So the answer is a number 10 envelope with the docket number on the outside, and we merge that data for you. You just have to say that's what you want, and we'll do it. Okay. Another thing, All too, right, so in our, in our call center, we have been able to achieve uh, and, and maintain about 7% about conversion on those calls. So if we're calling 100 attorneys for you, statistically, you should get around seven appointments on average. Um, those well, the thing is, more. yeah, yeah, I've, I've got it set up where y'all going to send me the uh, envelopes, and uh, and I'm going to, like, write the letter and, and put it in there and send it out. Uh, I didn't I didn't sign up for you to do any other work besides, uh, I, I suppose, I'm not, I suppose I'm supposed to type up the letter. Is that correct? Or? How's this? It's not, not, not a great idea. I mean, we're not doing that. I'm sure that that I think there's, I think you probably are, think you're doing something that you might not be. Typically, I'm unaware that we're doing just envelopes at all. I'm not saying that we wouldn't, but that's not that's not a product that we usually sell. 
Oh yeah, but um, but uh, I've got one. I've got the letter draft. Maybe that's what it is. I'm working on a couple of different lists at the moment. At the moment, so I'm, I might have got messed up. But I've got one. Uh, I edited one. I'm supposed to supply that to you, right? Uh, and and then you're going to uh, type up the letters and the envelopes and send them back to me. Yes, that's correct. You bet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So when I when I finish this letter, then I will just like email it to you. Correct. Yeah. I'm. Yeah. You. You mean you. You get us a copy of the letter. We'll format it correctly. Make sure it looks perfect. You'll receive a proof copy of it so you can see it. Make sure that it's exactly what you want. And we do that before we do any mailings at all. You. You receive and approve a proof. Okay. Okay. All and right. we send it back to you in email in a PDF form so you see exactly what's going out. We don't make you wait to get it in the mail, but we send it to you in a PDF so you'll get a good a good understanding of exactly what your customer is going to see. Yeah, and so you'll, you'll okay, all right. And then, uh, if it needs any editing or something, I'm, I'm sure you'll let me know about it, correct? A absolutely. We'll, we'll typically, we'll edit it for you if we think it needs it, and we'll send it back to you in the proof, and you can say, yeah, that's great. Okay, okay. All right. Well, thank you. That gets you, that gets you. Somebody else was going to say something. What was it? Did anybody have anything else? No, I was just going to clarify that um, that unless you unless you for some reason want your local postmark on there, we don't send the letters back to you. We we do that for some people. We drop ship them, but for the most part, we mail them from our our mail center. And it yeah. and we find it it, it typically does. But so I wasn't real sure if you were talking about sending the proof back or actually sending the letters back. I just yeah, wanted to clarify. He's all good. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. How many Steve, you all squared you? away, bud? We got you answered. You're good? Uh, well, I, I'm, evidently I need to read some more or something. I thought this was like you were going to write the letters and the envelopes, and then I was going to stuff it and put my mail on it. I didn't know. That's what I thought. Uh, uh, evidently I got messed up somewhere along the line, but... I'll uh, I'll get back into it and check it out. All right. It would, listen, would you rather – we can certainly – why don't we have somebody reach out to you and make sure you're clear on all this. I'll have somebody – I've got your info here. I'll have them call you right after the call. How about that? Okay. Okay. That'll work. All right. We'll do it that way, and we'll get you squared away. Uh, let's take the next person, and that is phone number ending in 6329. 6329. Hello. Hi. Here I am. Hey there. Hi. Um, so I've been working with you guys for a couple months, and I think I'm on like my third or fourth batch of leads going really well. I just have a question, I guess, about the text and the, like, your, the background um, aspect of you guys pulling this information. I'm really familiar with probate, so I know that the personal representative information is displayed pretty clearly on the pleading forms. Um, I just had a couple of leads that that are completely off, like not the right person at all. Um, you know, numbers being incorrect, that's, that's to be expected. But my question is uh, kind of, I guess, what's the, the protocol or process of your person who's pulling these court files? Because, again, this information is displayed pretty clearly on the form, so I'm, I'm just confused at how I'm getting some completely incorrect information. <laughs> so we're pulling well, directly from the... Yeah, go ahead. We, we pulled directly from the petition, um, okay. which you're probably you're familiar with. So that comes out of the courthouse, sometimes even by pen and paper, and it gets databased, and we it runs through a series of, of processes there. The first being we go out and we skip trace to bring back the phone numbers. That's the most common place where we see this. If there's you know a Jane Doe, two Jane Does in the same zip code, then you could get that. And even if each of those Jane Doe's, if we also pull a number for each of those Jane Doe's spouses, you might end up with mm -hmm. a Harry Smith who's married to Jane Doe, but didn't, they didn't change their names, and that's attached to that file. So sometimes okay. that comes in in, in, in phone, phone number gathering. 
once we've done that, we're validating for addresses, and then we also have a validation for the DNC on those phone numbers. But whatever is on public record comes back to us, and I'm not going to say that humans never make a mistake, but it's it's pretty rare. And in five years of doing this, we've had very few problems with researchers where we've had to, you know, go back and and clean things up. So. We have a pretty tight process. Usually where you're talking to the wrong people, it's it's because of a common name and people associated with them. We grab the wrong phone numbers. But if that's not what you're seeing, we definitely want specifics on the ones you're looking at so we can dig in deeper and see what the problem was. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. So okay. basically, just say, you, if you want to send those back to us, we'll look into it if you get, you know, if it's just a couple of them, but the good news is you said you're doing pretty well with the program. Any any specific successes you want to share so far? I know you're just kind of getting started. Yeah, um, I have um, two. So I've got I've met with two person representatives thus far, and one one client I'm actually setting up with an estate planning attorney. They haven't gotten their probate started yet. Um, or I'm sorry, they started on their own and then just they need a little bit of uh, legal advice. So I'm connecting them with um, uh, an old colleague of mine, and from there I will help them, you know, with the sell of the home. And uh, it's kind of the same thing for another client. She was going about it on her own and um, saved my number from a voicemail I left her and realized that she needed a little bit of help. And my uh, certified probate expert title kind of uh, attracted her to call me back. So I actually met her at the courthouse and helped her iron out a few a few errors in her petition and um, same thing I'll be, I'll be helping that family list their home soon in the next couple of months as well so it works and um, it's great information uh, I've, I've, I've run over a couple of not just the phone numbers being wrong but the person is like I have no idea what we're talking about like I'm not working a probate in this county like I don't know where you got my number so it's definitely not the bulk of my leads um, but it's happened once or twice so if I'll send you guys kind of an email on the back end if, um, if it's sure. this. Sure. And that, oh, and Chad, I don't know if you wanted to comment, but that typically happens when, because we pull multiple phone numbers, and maybe one of them will be a different John Smith. So if you call that John Smith, then he doesn't know anything about it. That's why you got to call all the numbers on there. But if, if right. you have a question, send it to us, and we'll look into it for sure. For sure. Thank you, guys. All right. All righty. Good deal. Next caller up is ending in 5418. Hello. Hey there. Rick. This is Rick in California, and I uh, had a question on the introduction to uh, attorneys. I mean, you have some things you'd care to share about some of the things we might say in order to get in the door, <laughs> past the gatekeeper and that sort of thing. First thing I'll say is it's a lot easier than you think it is. Um, <laughs> it's usually everybody who goes out, if you meet with three and you don't strike up a relationship, I'll be shocked. Um, the idea is to approach them and show them how there's a business in the community that's complementary, complementary to what they've built their career around. So most people are going to come in saying, I'm an investor, pitch me some deals, throw me houses, or what, you know, you got any listing referrals? And it's going to be a me, me, me approach. So just with like everything we teach, you know, be empathetic to that attorney's position. So their their job represents about 25% of the responsibility in a, in a probate case. 75% is on the personal representative's shoulders. Maybe the family's helping. Maybe the family's not helping. Maybe they're making it even harder. So show them how you have a service that bridges the gap between what they are going to do in their office and what needs to be done to close the file and how you can do that without needing a babysitter and uh, you're proactively doing that and so proactively you've gone to the courthouse gathered the data and noticed that their name shows up month after month after month so you really just thought you needed to introduce yourself so you could see if there's any way you guys could help each other and when you take that approach it usually turns a five minute meeting into an hour conversation and most folks end up with referrals in the first month or two after starting those. A piece that will really help you, um, we, we do, at this point, who knows, hundreds of variations of trifold brochures. And we have graphics that kind of show the, the hub and wheel model where you're the spoke in the middle. And the attorney is just, you know, you need them to understand that they're just one of the spokes in your wheel and vice versa. 
So you're on their team, they're on your team, and you all have the same end goal, help the family and maximize the equity and get it done as quick as possible. But having those trifold brochures can be really, really impactful. And a lot of folks have even gone to the point where they'll go buy plexiglass stands, load it with, you know, with 50 or 75, however many go in there, and leave it at the front desk. And surprisingly, attorneys are open to that. And that gives you a reason to go back week after week to replenish it, to touch base, be a, a, you know, front of mind, find out what, you know, learn more about their business, and that helps you see more opportunities to be of a higher service to them and earn those referrals. But that is, uh, that's been effective, and it doesn't matter how urban or how rural the market, um, it seems to be effective nationwide. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's as good as it gets right there. Thank you. <laughs> yep. And, Chad, um, we've covered this many times in role play calls also. If, um, I would also encourage you to go to our website and just type in the search bar uh, what would they put in there? Prospecting attorneys, and you'll hear several role plays that which has really expanded on this to a greater degree. Yeah. So in the top right of our any page on our site, there's a search bar, and that's a universal search. So just put in attorney, attorneys, um, maybe even lawyers, lawyer, lawyers. We usually use attorney or attorneys, but. All, all this content, including the call we're on right now, is being transcribed and indexed. So any conversations we've had, any blog posts we've posted about attorneys, um, it'll take you to that content. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Hey, Chad, take a second, and, and Rick, we're going to camp on you for just a second, not necessarily about this, but I think it, 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 it's important to reiterate what you're talking about in terms of helping people find stuff. We're going out of our way to make sure that anything that we do, uh, we not only, you know, keep it here and do it on these calls and we take any calls that come in and you obviously know that, but we're doing everything we can to to capture that information and then be able to distill it back to you like this. And everything that we've done, everything that we do online, we're trying to make that search bar give you as much information as we can possibly give you. And and one of the first places that you should ever look for anything you're trying to find, we've got the deepest wealth of knowledge, I, I, would, I, I will unabashedly say probably in the world, on this topic, on probate. We've been doing this a long time. We've, we've really, you know, it's like the guy on the commercial. We've done a few things. We've seen a few things. And we've been asked a lot of questions. It's forced us to do a bunch of research, and we do that, and we look at a lot of things. So use that search bar whenever you can, and, and if you find something that we haven't answered and you, you, know, you put it up here, all you do is ask it on this call, and it'll it'll help you and everybody else. But Chad's making a really good point that we don't hit sometimes as hard as we should. We're giving you so much data that that's a great place to start. Do you agree, Chad? We are all the leads. Bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, bum, bum. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and you, and you're talking you're about all. the farmers' commercials, right? But you look uh, and you look like the guy except you're a little bit taller and a little bit uh, a little bit chunkier. <laughs> you just called me Chucky on a recorded call. Come on, meow. Yeah. Well, that's all right. I'm way chunkier than you are, brother. <laughs> all right. Anyway, point being that, that we do a great job with this in terms of pro providing you data, and, and it's a great resource for you. So it's, it's someplace you can definitely look when we're not handy. Go there first, and you'll find nine times out of ten, we've talked about it before. It's there, and, and, and uh, you'll find a lot of great info. Thank you very much. Rick, you good? I'm, I'm good. Thank you so much. Excellent. All right, bud. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, caller ending. And before I do that, I want to say one thing. Got two, two more people available in the queue, and we've got room for plenty more. So if you got a question, you want to share your success or anything else, please jump in the queue. We don't want to talk to ourselves. We want to talk to you. That's what this is about. So please get there with us quickly. 3611, you are up. Kevin. Bueller. Bueller. Kevin. <laughs> oh, Kevin. Kevin, are you there? Are you there? Kevin, there you go. I can't go. talk if I'm if I can't talk if I'm muted, man. So what are you guys doing? So um, All right, now we're muted. You go ahead. Okay, thank you. What I was going to say is that um 
regarding Chad's the the Chucky remark, I'd just like to say I resemble that remark is all I can say. So if you guys ever, literally, Chad and I are going to have a a pick, and I, we're twins. He's six seven, I'm six four, and of course shaved head. We're not bald; it's shaved. I just always like to make clear, make that very clear. So a good anyway, point. Yeah, exactly. That's what. Um, so here's my question. Uh, I've got a question. Um, what I, I'm afraid I might have a little bit of knowledge gap, and I just want to make sure I don't. There's not, you know, there's stuff that you know, there's stuff that you know, you don't know. But sometimes there's some stuff you don't know that you don't know. And this is the part that I want to make sure that that's not the case. Um, when the, when the PR is named to the letters testamentary, I know obviously they have the authority to list the property. My question is, what happens between then and the and if I, we get it under contract either with uh, as a, as, a, as an investor as I put it under contract, and ultimately sell it, or if we list it, what happens between that time and the time that um, the the family or the court or whatever has the authority to then execute that sale? I've always heard these horror stories. Oh my gosh, probate can take months and years or whatever, but I haven't run across that. And I'm just wondering if there's anything that I'm missing, and I'm going to probably call an attorney or two here locally, but Chad, I'd just like Walk me through if there's something I'm missing in between. Once they list it, does that typically mean they can go ahead and sell it as well? So that's that's the inflection point state by state. So in some states like Virginia, we have an express lane. As soon as they have their letters, you can list it and close tomorrow. In states like California, it can be six to nine months before you get into the court and get you know go through the overbid process and have an approved contract. So. I, I'm not sure. You're in Oklahoma, right? Correct. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't coached a lot of folks in Oklahoma, but you, like Texas is pretty close. Would you say your laws, the 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 envi your law environment is similar to Texas, or is it more? I don't know. There's really not much that's similar to Texas. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> yeah. So like in Texas is one of those kind of probate friendly states where you you can actually move through pretty quick, but. In most states, the worst case scenario is you need to go take the con take the ratified purchase agreement to the probate attorney. The probate attorney uh, presents that in the next scheduled hearing, and it gets stamped with approval. You can move forward and close, and that might take 30 days. In states right, like California, right. it's much more much more drawn out, and the courts are more backed up. Even here in Florida, the courts are more are more backed up. Um, in Texas, there's a loophole called monument of title, but it's only in Texas where you can actually carve the real estate out of the probate and move forward like a, a, a you know conventional transaction. But that's one of those things that, as I told you in mastery, pick up the phone, call the probate clerk, and make sure you're clear on those on, on those the, you know on your local process. I mean, it's almost impossible. I have a pretty good knowledge nationwide, but it's impossible for me to know every county. But I'll say that you know California and Hawaii and Nevada seem to be that those are the more complex ones that take longer, um, and then there's some on the other end of the spectrum that are ridiculously simple. Most are in the middle. There may be you may be in a state like Florida where you just ha you have to get approval, but it doesn't take that long. It, you don't have to wait nine months. Now, right. where some people get confused is they have a perception that you can't close real estate until the end of the probate, which is going to be 9 to 12 months. And in most cases, that's a misperception. In most cases, you can close the real estate. The funds can be released from escrow to the estate bank account as long as there was a fidelity bond either waived by the will or purchased by the estate. And in Virginia, we just purchased those at the closing table. Like, we'll go ahead, list the real estate, get it under contract, put it in escrow, and then there'll be a line item for 250 bucks usually on the the settlement statement for the fidelity bond, which allows escrow to release now versus after probate closes. So that's the misconception that a lot of folks get hung up on, and they think they can't do anything. They're, they're like, oh, well, you know, the, the the PR told me or my broker told me this takes six to nine months, and you can't do anything till it's over. The reality is you can do most things. It just has to stay inside of the estate. So it has to be, you know, it has to stay on the inventory list or on the asset list until it's finally approved and, and the distribution happens. So you can probably find out in 10 minutes if you just pick up the phone and call the, your county probate clerk. They can probably help mm -hmm. you. 
The other idea you had to ask an attorney is even better because that gives you a reason to kind of show off a little bit and show him that you know you you continue to raise the bar for yourself. And mm -hmm. I would use your your stoicism too. Your you know sometimes you just know what you don't know, and I know I know that I don't know this, but I think you know this. You, you can try mm -hmm. that. I'm sure that's effective too. Right. <laughs> But I think you're probably going to find it's it's not the case that it's going to take you six to nine months to close one in Oklahoma. And I'd appreciate yeah. it if you report back to me so that way I kind of know a little bit more about Oklahoma. What I do know is I know that there have been some conversations where the the attorney has stated to the, to the uh, PR or something that, yeah, we need to make sure we take this to the judge and get him to sign off. So I think that's probably all that has to happen. But yeah. – um, so but let me ask you this. One of the scenarios I just closed recently, I guess maybe the the probate process was complete because it was already done and she could sell it. And, again, I just need to for sure understand what that missing step is in between so I can, you know, with confidence, uh, especially if I have an investor that wants to buy it two or three weeks from now and quick close. Sure. I want to make sure there's no gap there, you know what I'm saying, to be able to have right. it done quickly. So, yeah. okay, cool. All right. I will report back. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, Thanks, Kevin, real quick, real quick. I know you're relatively new with us, but you are definitely a go-getter. Any, I'm looking for my win of the week. Any new deals you want to report? I know you've told us about a few, a few in the past. Any new successes yeah. you want to report this week? Um, no, not necessarily. I'm just, uh, I met with a, an amazing contractor this morning that he absolutely will do two to four grand of deferred maintenance work and wait and uh, charge that at, at, on, at, on the closing day. So and I've Great. known him for a long time. So that's, a, again, just when families don't, you know, if you can say, hey, I know you don't have a ton of cash or whatever, right, and they don't know what they can access, but if we can get someone in there, paint, carpet, a few things, and, then, you know, could triple or quadruple their money and they don't have to pay it till closing, again, just another way of adding value. And I so that's, I guess, a win, but, Hopefully I'll have a bunch yep. more next week. But, yeah, it's going well. I really appreciate you guys a lot. So. Thank nice, you, sir. man. You're making good progress. Every week you're you're getting a step closer to having this fully dialed in. So congrats. Yeah. Thanks, man. You guys have a good day. You too, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Jimmy, how many we got in the queue? Timothy, are you there? Jim, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. I'm sorry, guys. I, I had it on mute. My bad. Um, we've got six <laughs> more people in the queue and now seven people in the queue. And so uh, if you want to get in, get in because we are going to cut it off shortly. We've got more, more than we can maybe get to, but we'll get to them all if you get in there now. Next one up is ending in 5000. You're up. 50000. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Up, oh, coming up now. Did you get that one? Five zero zero zero. Nope. All right. Next one ending in one four five five. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. This is Tito here from uh, Seattle. So, a question. Um, um, uh, you know, as I just sent out my my first batch of of, of mailers, right? And I went with the follow up call. Um, is there a? I know. Um, I was trying to look for it, but a kind of like a um, blueprint of kind of the scripts so of when we do the call um, on the, in, in the, the resources. Yeah, so if you go to your, the, the, have you, did you finish the fast track training when you first signed up? Uh, yes, I, I did. So in module three, as soon as the video finishes playing, some downloads will pop up below it, and mm -hmm. one of those is a one of those is a probate seller interview sheet, and that's kind of the framework that that our that our role plays will follow. Mm -hmm. And it's not a script; it's going to show you kind of what information you need to know, and then the role plays will help you build that sales language. Um, there's also a script if you if you look in um, in our Facebook group, All the Leads Mastermind. There's mm -hmm. under the files and under the files tab in that group, there's a script that I I wrote that will kind of help get you started. It's, there's, there's so many directions these conversations can go. We don't even attempt to write out comprehensive script books. 
because it would be a thousand pages thick. So the idea is, you know, print off that probate seller interview sheet and listen to a couple of role play calls. We have, I think at this point, 41 hours of just specific probate role play. And in a couple of hours, most people have the confidence they need and know how to, to navigate the conversations and, and, you know, lead the conversations versus following. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, and thanks. And I, do, you know and I wanna, to, do you know how to get to the role play archives? Um, I'm sure I can figure it out, yeah. So. Okay, so if, if you go on the public side, we have video, audio, both. So in subscriber portal, you can click under education and training, conference call archive. That's the audio mm -hmm. files. Um, okay. If you want the, the video, it's it's all, you can go to alltheleads.com forward slash CCVA for conference call video archive. And that will mm -hmm. take you to every every call we've ever done. It's in video and has all the transcriptions with it. So however you want to consume it, it's there for you in different formats. All right. Thank you. All righty. Good enough. Uh, the next caller is ending in 7741. Hi, this is David Wilson from Indianapolis. How are you doing today? Good, man. How are you? Doing great. I just signed up with all the leads. I actually had it a long time ago, but I couldn't really, you know, afford it a long time ago. But I'm, I can afford it now, so I'm, I'm pulling out all stops. So here's the question I have since I just signed up today. One, um, the ISAs, when they make the, um, the phone calls to the personal representatives and the attorneys and they're setting the appointments, are they setting the, um, the appointments for me to do the listening um, presentation or are they setting appointments for me to follow up um, with the call that they've spoken with them? Are you, are you saying is it face-to-face -face versus a phone appointment? Right, that's what I'm asking. What, what, what exactly are they setting up? Because I'm... Yeah, so when po when possible, we're going to, like, when we when we see the opening, we're going all the way for the face-to-face. -face. That happens about 20% of the time. So 80% of the time, we're going to set you up for a follow-up phone appointment, and then you get the face-to-face. -face. But 20% of the time, we have such good rapport, we can go deeper and go all the way to getting the actual face-to-face -face appointment for you. Okay. And then my other half of that question is, because I spoke with Darcy, and Darcy told me that when I meet with the personal representatives, that sometimes the attorneys will tell them that it's going to take, you know, six months or it might take a little while before they can actually put the property in the market. And she told me to go ahead and try and go and get the listing and to ask them, like, well, if it's going to be three months out, do you want to close in three months or do you want to just get started in three months? And most of them are going to say they want to close in three months. So to go ahead and get it listed, put on the market, and, show, and go ahead and try and get a buyer for the property. And, and that, that let the attorney know that you're doing that, and that kind of helps the, the process as well. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And and you you will hear that. Like uh, for some reason, you know, PRs have so much being thrown at them, and it's such a new experience. When the attorney says it might take six to nine months, some some of them here don't do anything for six to nine months. And it's really easy to coach them through that. And, and the line you just used comes from, from Jim, Darcy's dad, and my partner. Like, it's a great line. It's super effective. Um, so that usually gets, gets you over that hump, and people realize, oh, I can do this. And, and back to the earlier caller, as long as they have the letters testamentary, so they've been granted the official authority by the court, then you can list it and move forward. And if you're in a, if if Indiana if if Indiana takes a while to process like if you have to have court approval, just make sure in your purchase and sale agreement that it says contingent. You know this will close x number of days uh, on or before x number of days from probate court approval. And this this and make it also say this this agreement is contingent upon probate court approval. Okay, That's so it's contingent so, have to be in it. Right, because that was my other question I was going to ask. Like, okay, so we have a buyer, they put it under contract, and let's say even if they're getting bank financing, that, that still will take maybe 30 to 45 days out. But even then we get to that point, we're like, okay, we're ready to close, but it hasn't officially gone through the probate process. Do we need to get an extension or, you know, kind of... Well, what I do is, so I, co I coach my buyer's agents, just like with a short sale, coach the buyer's agent before you ratify the agreement Try to get them comfortable with not putting a closing date on the contract. 
what I do is I put an asterisk in the date field and uh, like asterisk see additional terms and then I'll go to additional terms and write in this agreement is contingent upon probate court approval closing shall occur on or before 30 days from the date of probate court approval something along those lines that way you're not chasing contract amendments and chasing you know multiple parties to a contract and it's just as valid as, as if you amended the contract but you're never you don't have to go you don't have to go back and do admin work that you don't get paid for okay and I'll Sounds tell you, the probate, you. Attorney is going, the probate attorney will appreciate that because if it has a date on it, then he has to be aware of that, and he has to get the amendments before he takes it to court to get approval because he's going to look like a fool if he takes a contract that's past the closing date, right? So right. things like that will just make it more efficient for everybody. Okay. All right. Then thank you guys for really answering my question. Awesome. Great question. Thank you. Who's up Welcome next? back, man. All right. Next up is caller ending in five one eight two. You're up five one eight two. You're in Europe. Okay. Hello. Hello there. Hello. Can you hear Hi. me? Yep. Yes, Go please. ahead. We're ready. Okay. Great. Um, this is kind of similar to Kevin's question um, earlier. So I have a similar situation where the PR keeps saying, "Oh, my lawyer says." I can't do anything until it has gone through probate. Um, and I explained the monument of title situation to him, but turns out that there is another lien on the house. And as a result, you know, we can't use the monument, we can't go the monument of title route. My question is how to just stay in the loop with this guy so that whenever he is ready to make a move, he comes to us because the house is actually a hot cake. The house and I don't what? want to lose it. I said the house is like a it's a it's a very good deal if we can work with him. Yeah. Um I just don't want to lose it to I just right. don't want him to go into this oblivion of I'm waiting for my lawyer, I'm waiting for my lawyer. What what are the things I can do to stay front of mind for him? So it sounds like you're in Texas, right? Yes, I am. So the fact is he can list the property. Now, are you looking to buy or list? Um, to buy. Well, okay. we could do both. So, well, he, whatever it is, he can sign. He can sign paperwork today. He just thinks he can't. Um, he's one of those people that, that heard you can't do anything this whole process. But, and, again, the question that, that Jim had, the, the good question is, well, would you rather be getting started in six months or would you rather be done in six months? Right. And a, a good way to help to, like, to not offend people, like a, a, a non-confrontational way, is just validate their feelings. Say, oh, you know, listen, I'd say at least eight out of ten of the, fo the families we work with feel to think the same thing. But what they find is, like, the probate law allows you, once you have letters testamentary, that gives you the authority to go ahead and get the property on the market. And in the eyes of the state and the probate attorney and a, a, you know me, who's trying to maximize your equity, that's the best thing to do. So if if you knew that it, it was you know legal and and in your best interest to go ahead and get the home on the market, would you be? Are you ready to do that? And that way you can you know show them that that other people have this the same thought process they're going through, but like feel I know how you feel. That's how some of our best clients have felt. What we found is that or, is that when they fully understood, they were ready to move forward because they wanted to be closed in three months, not starting, and kind right. of turn it into that feel felt found story. Now this one you know it's it's harder to re-enter that conversation and use that tactic for you. What I would say is. Think of your conversation and of all the details that, you know, hopefully you ask good questions and you know about the personal property, you know about what his biggest problems are, and think mm -hmm. about what those problems are. How can you proactively bring a solution to the table that he hasn't even asked for? Maybe that's a property valuation. Maybe that's a free consultation with the uh, estate sale company to, like a, to appraise the, the personal property. Maybe okay. it's a, cl a classic car salesman that can come and look at the 69 Camaro in the barn. Like, whatever details you can take from the conversation 
and go find somebody on your team or some, some part of your service that you can do now, even if the property's not listed, that's going to show, it's going to have a, a high perceived you know, value, but it's not really going to cost you anything. You're not out of pocket anything but a little bit of effort and mm -hmm. a good idea. Okay. And that's how you can re-enter that conversation. Find something that's going to be valuable to them. Have you given them a valuation on the property? No, but I'm thinking that maybe that's something I can do, like just show them a CMA report. So to just Is show your market, them what they after. Do you feel like your market's trending up value. or down? Right. The market that is in in Austin, Texas, is still trending up. It's been yeah, a it's, hot market for a while. Up. So what price range is this Is this subject property? Um, after repair values is in the early 300. Okay. And what's the median in Austin right now? Um, like, oh gosh, I couldn't answer that question because we're more um, familiar with the Houston market. We're actually surprised that the house is in Austin, but I think the guy lives in Houston, so. Okay, where I'm, where I'm going with this, in, in most hot markets like Austin, there's a lack of affordable inventory. So I was trying to figure out, is 300 an affordable price or is that a luxury price in his Oh, right, right. No, in terms, for, at least for what I know, the limited stuff I know about Austin, it's 300 is definitely affordable compared with the other okay. things that, so yeah, what you especially can show for the him. area as well. What you can show him is the lack of affordable inventory. So the supply demand is on his side. So when mm -hmm. when there's a lo when there's low supply and high demand, that's when the seller wins, right? He gets the higher price. Yeah. If there if there's a shift in that, if there's a risk of that shifting, it's it can be a, a broader economic risk of you know buyers taking the sidelines. But right now they're looking. So you can paint that picture, you know, potentially, and, and you're going to know that market better than me, especially when you look, but I'm trying to give you some, some ammunition to go back in and show him how mm -hmm. it makes sense to get it on the market now versus waiting six months for an economic downturn to scare buyers to the sidelines and then you're sitting there holding houses because nationwide you, you see inventory ramping up. Affordable inventory is yeah. not, but inventory across the board is coming up and there it's there's signs of correction who knows when it'll be but you might use some of that you know and I don't want to call it a fear tactic because it's it's I mean affordable inventory is selling quick right now because there's there's such a you know there's so so little inventory because of how the banks reacted in 08 there's mm -hmm. just a huge shortage in that price range so if you can show him how you can sell it for more money now versus 6 months from now he may jump on on just that and you can do that with okay. I really like a market absorption analysis, and I go back two years on mine. And it's, if you're not familiar with what that is, you can look online. There's, it's, I took it from the commercial real estate world. Essentially, what I'm doing is taking two years of data and spotting the trends based on days on market. And we're looking at not only what sold, but what expired, what you know, what's currently on the market, active and pending. So it kind of gives a 360 degree view of the trend which to me is more important than a six month snapshot of what sold. So you can you can, you know, do a do a report like that that will it's it's a reason to reopen the conversation, but it also will show it can it potentially can show him the urgency of getting it on the market now versus waiting. And you can also just to drive that point home, if you figure out how much the property taxes are, how much vacant insurance is and is there vacant insurance on the property? If not, you can help him that way too. But figure up the cost. So there's there's a there's a, a cost of there's potentially a cost of waiting, but there's for sure mm -hmm. the sunk cost. The sunk cost of waiting is is easy to figure out. That's just the the holding cost of a piece of real estate. So you can show him how you know you're going to get more money if you sell now, and you'll even save more money by not holding on to it for another six months. And that should okay. be enough ammo to get your foot to get get something signed. Okay. All righty. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great question and, and as usual, a great answer. Next caller ending in 8328. You're up. 8328. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Hear Go me? ahead. Oh, hi. Yeah, this is, uh, my name is Dario from, um, I'm in Texas right here in Houston. 
And I got a question. So I come across this property, right? And um, it's, it's vacant. And um, from my research, I found out the, the owners passed away, I think, in like 2015, um, one in 2013, one in 2015. And so I reached out to the heirs. But they, they had um, they have a son and a daughter, and I reached out to them. And um, the daughter believes the house is owned by the bank. But well, from my research, yes, the bank does have a lien on the property, but I believe they still have a right to it. I mean, their name is still on the property. So um, how, do, how do I go about that? Do I need to, I mean, how do I go about that and trying to buy the house from yeah. them? I'm, I'm not sure what to do next. So were the estates probated? Um, I didn't see any. I know the the, the wife was. I mean, the, there's a probate record on the on the wife, and she passed everything to the husband, but the husband passed away two years later. And the only thing I saw from him was the power of attorney given to the son, but I didn't see any probate okay. record on. I don't. Okay, so if the husband, if if his estate was not probated, that's step one. Someone needs to, the, one of the kids need to, you need to find out first, was there a will? And if there was a will, they need to take that, and whoever's named as the executor in the will needs to step forward and open probate. Um, the fact that you're in Texas, you may, like, you may be able to carve the real estate out while you're doing that by petitioning for, for monumental title. Um, it may, the house may have to stay in probate. But in order to, to close the chain of title, you're going to have to probate. You're going to have to probate it, or or have it be exempt from probate. Um, the other thing that you can do proactively is kind of run a preliminary title search on your own. So, are you close to the courthouse where you can run down and, and do full title on your own? Um, I went. I just went to the court, the website and um, like a county court okay. website to to run the title. Like, I mean, just see what the liens on the property and things like that. Okay, so you've already you've already seen the the deceased dad. His name is on title, correct? Yes. Okay. But as, um, but then the bank's name is also on title, so. It's on title, or it's recorded against the title as a, a note. Uh, uh, um, it's so on the tax assessor's website, like they they have an account on the property also. But then on the title on the county. On the county website, it's just it's just the wife and um, the, the man and his wife. Okay. So, so then the next step I would take, you need to go look and see if you can find a. I don't know if it's if it's this terminology in Texas. In Virginia, I would look for the notice of trustee sale. So if they actually went through the foreclosure process, I can find that in the, in the history of you know the classified section of a local newspaper. Um, if you if you can see the title, like if they if they initiated the foreclosure process and went through that, that sh that should be also recorded against the title. Yes, but, and that's what I, that's what I thought, but it's not recorded, so I don't think they foreclosed. Though the judgment passed, the judgment is on the title, but they not they haven't foreclosed. So, okay. Do you know a probate attorney yet? Um, no. So I. I How about a time? This is a. Hold on. How about this a title company? Really, yeah. Hold, hold I, I, on, I, please. <laughs> so this is this is a really good reason to reach out to a probate attorney, and because this can become a, a, a case they get paid for. So they have a lot of incentive to help you figure this out, right? So okay. contact them, especially if it's a probate attorney that handles real estate closings. But reach out to an attorney and say, you know, the kids think the bank took this property. I can't find any evidence that the bank took it. I believe that they actually, you know, the, well, we know that it needs probated, so obviously I'm going to refer you to these folks, but I believe that the home belongs to them and they don't know that because the bank either messed something up or, or you know, because the reason I'm recommending this, the bank may have realized that they lost the paperwork as part of the robo-signing ordeal. And they might have back, they may have backed off of their own foreclosure after they initiated it. This, this has happened in, in other places, Florida being one that it's very, very common for stuff like that. So uh, it's worth referring it to a probate attorney to help him help have him help you dig through it because he's going to get the probate case out of it. 
and you, he's going to have allegiance to you because you brought the deal to him, right? And okay. Jim, Jim has a suggestion about title companies too. Well, no, I was just going to say if you um, if you have a title company you deal with on a regular basis, they could probably pull a title for you real quick and just kind of sort it out for you if you don't if you can't find an attorney to do it. You know, if you can't find an attorney to do it for free, a title company will usually do it. You know, if if it's somebody you give business to on a regular basis, and the other thing I was going to say, this could be a home run for you. Can you imagine if the people thought it was foreclosed, and you come back and say it's not only not foreclosed, but I want to buy it, and you know, if you get them anything out of this, you're you're going to be a hero. So it could potentially be a really good deal for you. Right, right, and that's what. But then I don't want to. So I just wanted to. Do I need any commit? I don't need them to. I don't need because I. I want to be sure there's something in there before I make any promises. So, and that's why I no. wasn't sure if I need a, an agreement, a purchase agreement before I talk to the attorney or title company. And so that's where I was a little confused about. Well, I mean, go sign an option. If if you aren't sure if you can sign a purchase agreement, just go sign an option agreement with them, and that gives you the equitable interest you need. And actually, sign an option, and also get an authorization to release information. And that's a pretty accessible form. You can probably find one online. If that. But with an authorization to release, you can speak to the lender. You can speak to an attorney. Like, you can speak to anyone. You have an equitable interest, and you have the authority to talk to people about that property. Okay, so it's advice. So I, I should go back to the heirs and let, um, try to get um, an authorization. But then they don't want it, so. Uh, they and give, so I, I mean, ask. The, the the thing the disconnect here is that if it wasn't probated they might not have the authority to sign those forms so you got to fill in right. some blanks you need to back up and find out if the father's estate was probated if not they need to file probate then you can sign an option agreement and an authorization to release and then anyone should talk to you about it okay and if you want to just go ahead and Instead of the option, if at that point you can go ahead and go to a purchase agreement, if 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 they're willing to sell it, if if this is true, will you sell it to me? Then sign this. But if they're not comfortable with that, use the option agreement as a fallback. Okay. Please report right. back and let us know. Let us know how it goes. It sounds like it'd be a great deal for you potentially. Oh, definitely. I mean, I'll definitely report back. I probably. All right. Good enough. That's great, and we'll look, look forward to hearing from you. We've got three more people to get to, and we're going to try to get to them all. Uh, next one is ending in 6248. Good morning. It's Joyce in uh, Orange County, California. Hey, Joyce. I have a, a question about what you might recommend. I would like to um, invite my broker um, to go with me on an appointment that I have uh, secured a, a date for. Is is there a problem with that? And if there's two of us, do you have a recommendation about the best way to conduct the uh, appointment? Tell us why you want your broker there. Well, I've um, I've been on a couple of appointments, and um, and both of them are in my queue. They're fixers. Um, and the uh, PRs are working diligently on them and want to do more of the work themselves before they bring in a contractor. And the broker, my broker has probably more construction um, knowledge than I do. There you go. That's all you need. So just tell the truth. Just say, you know, listen, uh, Bob is my broker and he has years of experience in construction. So. When I know that I have to be accurate, I bring him along, and he's nice enough to come. So say hi to Bob, guys. All right, who's, show, who's giving the tour around here? And go right into it. You don't have to say any more than that. Is there any uh, issue with um, my talking over him or vice versa? Well, you guys need to set an expectation before the appointment. So if you feel like he's a stronger closer than you and you want him to get the deal, then you take the back seat and vice versa. If you feel like you've got control, he needs to understand that and not be walking on you during the appointment. 
Like he needs to know why he's there. Like be clear and be clear in your in his role and your expectation, so you guys aren't competing on the same appointment. That sounds really good. Do you have um, one last quick question? Um, my um, one of my um, clients that I have in what I call my queue uh, really has a massive um, fix fixer upper to do. I mean, it's, it's, he's got a lot of work both inside and out. And um, um, it's time for my uh, follow up call to him, and I want to ask him. Given the um, enormity of the job he's got, if he would like to take another look at at having a um, a person come in that I have a cash buyer and and give him an estimate on what he could walk away with immediately, is there any um, advice that you would have about um, how to do that? Has he gotten quotes for construction yet? He is working on it himself, and he's a contractor, and he is um, it's just taking him a very, very long time. And i got to believe okay. from talking with him that, you know, that it's a real big task, and at some point he might get sick of it, I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah, so I would, I would reopen the conversation. Don't go straight to that. Like, open the, reopen the conversation, ask him how it's going, get him to tell you some stories. Like, oh, well, what would you end up doing with the kitchen? Like, I, that looked like such a cool floor plan. Like, find something to focus in on and get him to talk about the project. And what you're looking for is how painful has this become. Like, if he's running out of money and he doesn't have time to get over there and it's taking forever and he starts giving you pain points, then you've got some traction, right? Then you can say, well, Bob, listen, it, it seems like, and these are the, key, the magic words, it seems like you, you're a little overwhelmed, and then be silent. So don't say you're overwhelmed, you needed a cash offer. It seems like you might be a little overwhelmed. What, could you use some help? And just be silent and let him vent. And this is where the real truth starts to come out. So he, he'll, he'll either tell you, no, 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 I got this, it's just here's my plan, or... I, you know, I just this keeps coming up and this and this and this and this and, and then you can follow up and say, all right, well, listen. Oftentimes, when when we work with folks in this situation, they find that it's it's a lot easier to just take a cash offer and let somebody else struggle the rest of the way through this. Is that something that that you'd like to to hear more about? And see what he says. And again, be silent, let him process, and then you'll hear the the true answer coming out of that. But if and if there's even an inkling of interest, go get your investor, put him in the car, and haul him over there, and show him that you're serious and you can have a cash offer, but before sunset, if he shows if he shows an interest in that. That's perfect. Can I get you Thank you. Uh huh. Perfect. All right. Good deal. All right. We got two more, and we're going to get through them, and that'll take us to past a little past our end point here. It is. Caller ending in 6855, 6855. Hi, guys. It's Cliff here in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And uh, calling in to talk about and ask you about um, call scripts uh, for using, like, a virtual assistant to be doing my calling and, um, you know, to try to get someone to, a phone appointment from me. And... Um, have uh, you guys? You, I know that you offer a service, and I've tried it. Uh, the limitation on it, as I understand, is the numbers that are on the do not call list are skipped because of the auto dialers that you guys use. You can't make those calls. So, using an outside service that's manual, they don't that doesn't have that limitation. I feel like I have maybe a better shot at getting a hold of more folks. And um, I'm wondering about using uh, a script, a sh you know, a short script uh, to try to get the appointment for me. I mean, once you got them on the phone, then it's all that information we need to get, and you know, that's pretty clear. But just to get the initial phone call is uh, my challenge. And that's what I'm trying to deal with right now. And did you have any are advice on a short Are you using offshore VAs? You know, I decided not. I, I tried it, and I thought it was no good. 
uh, because I recorded right. some of them and the quality was poor, and I didn't. I wouldn't want to do that myself. Yeah, for someone sounding it's, it's that really, way. It's so really, really so difficult. I said, no. So, no, I found a company you have... out of uh, Boise, Idaho, that's using okay. uh, folks that are, you know, all American folks, and that they'll train and work on your stuff with, you know, so they can just. And again, my all I really want for them to do is get through to someone and see if they can have any interest at all in getting help getting their property sold and would they like to talk to the expert and get a phone appointment. Just get, try to get me a phone sure. appointment. So how much access do you have to training? Do you have a dedicated caller and do you have access to, to train them personally or is it send us your script and we'll make your calls? It's a combined effort where they actually have their own trainer uh, and I did send them my script, which is 30 seconds. It's a short script. And, uh, uh, you know, I worked with Cliff Blackman. He wrote the book on how to sell your inherited home. Uh, if, you know, if you need help selling John John's home, uh, we can handle everything for you. We ha absolutely handle everything. Uh, when would be a good time for Mr. Blackman to give you a call? If he can answer all your okay, questions. Okay, I would... That's good, other than you went for the real estate too quick, and that's probably where they're getting shut down. So, and you, and I, I there's a copy of your book around here on my desk somewhere. You did, you've done a really yeah. good job with that. Thank you. And okay. you, you okay. should take a step back and get some more mileage out of that. Be Cliff the expert, Cliff the probate expert, Cliff the okay. local probate expert that has built okay. a team of people just to help families like yours. And he asked me to call to see if I could get you on his calendar because he he likes to talk to families early in the process and see just how he might be able to help. So would you guys would you be able to have just a maybe a, a 15 to 20 minute conversation tomorrow? I've got one o'clock and three o'clock. Yeah. We're not even talking about real estate. We're trying to find a family that's raising their mm -hmm. hand saying, "Yeah, we mm -hmm. could use some help." And what I've found is that especially with with newer VAs, the the mm -hmm. deeper they try to go, the quicker, like the, the they're coming off the rails. So if you can keep the conversation at that high level of people and situation, don't even like, and you might like once they've set the appointment, be like, okay, real quick, just so I can get the, the details in Cliff's calendar, can I ask you just a couple more questions? Yeah, okay. Um, it, one of the biggest challenges for most families is real estate. Is that something you guys need to talk about on 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 the appointment? Yes, no. Okay. And if there is real estate, can you tell me just a few details so I can so Cliff can do some homework before he calls? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So that da 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 and then wrap it up. Get some details, get off the phone. So that way they're handing they say, Here, Cliff, here's a family that raised their hand and said, We need help. They have yeah. a real estate. Here's how many bedrooms, here's how many baths. Now you go do your job. And you're, you're, if you do that, so focus on people and situation and your expertise, a broad expertise, not your real estate expertise, and then go for the appointment and then fill in some details. And then I really like the, uh, yeah, I really like the language you used right at the beginning. Go through that one more time for me. You did that so beautifully. I want to see if you I can. You uh... expect me to remember that? <laughs> Come on, man. You're the pro. <laughs> so it was, hey, hey, this is Chad from, from Cliff's office. I, I'm not sure if you know him, but it, Cliff, is he's a local author and, and uh, a helper of many families. He's built a team right. of folks here locally specifically to help families going through probate. And what we've learned is if we reach out early we know, and we can understand families' problems, we know we can help a lot more throughout the process. And Cliff, Cliff just asked me to give you a call and kind of introduce our company. And see if we might be able to get you on yeah, his calendar yeah, for yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Beautiful. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. So I'm going to work with them. I'll revise that script. Do you mind if I uh, email it to you for a two-second uh, okay? Uh, yeah, sure. That'll be fine. Okay. Okay. All right. Wait, we got uh, one way, I'm just, morning. Uh, I'm, I'm headed I'm to closing right now. On my, I'm closing one right now, and I just signed up another another one. Uh, pretty excited about it. So I'm gonna let you know. Well, back up. You're progress. back up. You, you yeah. just put your hat in the ring. Win of the week. Let's hear it. Okay. Well, the the new listing is uh, is about a five hundred thousand dollar single family home in uh, nice. Humboldt Pines, Florida, and uh, I, was, I was able to 
um, get it. It's interesting. He was uh, a summary uh, probate because there wasn't any real money, just the real estate, and he was doing it himself, no lawyer. And uh, yeah. so I actually went down. I met him at the courthouse as he was appearing uh, in the probate court and gave him a little <laughs> advice about how to present himself to the judge, having been an attorney for so many years myself. I kind of just gave him some pointers how to, you know, address the court. And uh, it turned out, before he left the hearing, the guy said, oh, well, here, go record this. It's not your property. He just, like, closed the probate right there and gave him the deed, gave him the title. So that was great. Had him sign the, list, the listing right there as the owner. It wasn't even in the probate <laughs> anymore. That is an awesome story. Isn't that pretty good? <laughs> it sounds like you need to hang out in the courtroom, like figure out what day probate court is and just set up your desk right there. <laughs> so, I, so I, I'm sitting in the courtroom, and everybody is wearing a suit and tie because they're all a bunch of lawyers uh, and women are dressed up. But there's one guy wearing, like, jeans and a T-shirt, and I'm going, that's my client. <laughs> 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 and sure enough, he was. He was. So. All right. Uh, so my hat is in the ring. Uh, it's my second oh, that's one. Two awesome. months, two deals. I know we're running over. We right. have one more person. Go for it. I just have to. Go ahead. I just have to say. No, I just wanted to say real quick. You know, I'm in the same market as you. I don't actively sell anymore, but I guess somebody yeah. forgot to tell you that we're in one of the most competitive markets in the country, and you just you just can't do that in, in Broward County. So congratulations. For, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, thanks. Congratulations right. for doing it anyway. That's good for you, man. Great job. All right, pal. All right, talk to you guys next right. week. Have a good one. Thanks, you guys Chris. have a good one. That sounded, that sounded like a, a, a South Florida redneck version of a James Grisham novel. I loved it. <laughs> All right, last caller, ending in 0982. You're up, and you're our last caller. Zero nine eight two. Oh, hey, that's me. Can you, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Hey, this is Donna. Um, this is a uh, this is a property actually hasn't hit probate. Uh, the mother died ten years ago. Um, <clears throat> the house is in her name. It does have a mortgage on it. Uh, the daughter was supposed to file uh, the probate, but she died five years later. So she's been dead five years, the mother's been dead ten years, and the son, uh, the property is now approaching um, foreclosure in Georgia, so that will foreclose in one month. So um, do you know any way that I could prevent the foreclosure, even though no so probate has been done? You mentioned the son, so there's the, the daughter who passed away had a brother? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the mother so had a brother, this, I mean a son. Right. The mother had a son and a daughter. The mother is right. deceased, the daughter is deceased, the son is not. Correct? Right. Right. Okay. So by state law, even if there wasn't a will, the son is the one that needs to file probate. Um, right. You, there, there's a few ways. Uh, the easiest way is to file probate and, and request that the, the attorney file an injunction to stop the foreclosure and to preserve the equity for the family. And it's a common thing. It, well, it, it's not, not it, it's common. So the first okay. step would be, you know, you can file probate in the next week and, and get an attorney and then let the attorney do his job from there. As soon, I mean, the second that you, that he gets the letters, when he gets the authority as the, as the administrator or the executor, get a listing agreement signed and get it on the market and get a copy of that to the attorney. And the, the attorney can then show the judge, you know, this family has equity. They're, they're doing their best to sell. We need to stop this foreclosure proceeding to give them the space to preserve the equity for the family. Okay. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Thank you so much because I did ask an attorney about it. He was a real estate attorney, and he didn't come up with any advice like this. So, um I appreciate that. And then uh, I did want a copy of that. Um, I don't know. Do you have a copy of uh, scripts like what Chad had mentioned on the phone? And the other person said, can I get it reviewed by you? And I, I would want a copy of that, please. You mean the, the ISA script that we were talking about? Um, an ISA script, so you already have those scripts. What Chad had mentioned is really a script that you already have. So if you go to All the Leads Mastermind, our Facebook group, 
Mm -hmm. Are you part of our group? Yes. Okay, go into the go into that group and click on the files tab. And then there you'll see an outbound probate script. I think it was it's dated like 2016. That's the only written script we have. And it's heavily disclaimered to help you understand these conversations go in so many directions. That's why we try to teach you sales language versus scripts. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the one thing we have. The, the best resource we have is the probate seller interview sheet paired with the role play calls. So you can actually look at the questions you need answered and listen to how we handle those and on the recordings. Okay. And is that uh, what you're calling an ISA sheet? Is that what Chad had just said to the other person that he wanted to know if he could send it to Chad and Chad? Uh, no, this is this it? is Chad speaking. So oh. we were talking. We, <laughs> Hi, we were talking about a simple script for his virtual assistant to use because the script right. that they're currently using just isn't working. So what he's going to do is write out that simple script that we role played and then send it to me for review. Can I get a copy of that? Because actually, it's very soft and gentle approach. So I would be making calls myself, but I like that general approach in regards to uh, how you addressed it. Sure. So Cliff, you can if you if you want, you can post that in the Facebook group and share it, or you can just simply go back and listen to the recording of this call, which will be posted later today or early tomorrow, and just write your own script from the the, the audio recording. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. This is our longest call of the year. We thank all of you for showing up, staying till the very end. And anybody who's been on these calls knows I always end them the same way. I, I thank you for being here. I particularly thank those who actively participated. And I challenge each one of you, just take one thought, one idea, one story, one thing that inspired you on this call, go out and try it yourself and come back next week and share the results with the group. Thanks so much, guys. Make it a great day. We'll talk to you same time next Thursday. Take care.